Welcome one and all, I'm Mark Passio of WhatOnEarthIsHappening.com. It's great to be part of the SEED4 virtual conference here today. I want to thank Brandon Martin and Nate Cap for hosting the event and for inviting me to speak. My presentation here today is entitled, Fake Ass Anarchists. And this is a presentation I've wanted to deliver for quite a long time. I think it's incredibly important that people in the anarchist community and in the freedom movement in general understand the fake forms of anarchy that are out there and operating as what I would consider one big psyop to try to prevent the understanding of what anarchy really is from propagating to the public at large. And uh, I'll be explaining more about that as we delve into the presentation. I only have a couple of quick caveats before I begin, as I do with most of my presentations. This is largely for the internet viewing audience. There is nothing new under the sun. You will not be seeing or hearing anything completely new here today. As that an ancient saying goes, there is nothing new under the sun. This means that truth is objective and eternal. It has always been here and it always will be here. All that I can do as a presenter is to present this information in the form of a personalized framework with my particular style and aesthetics applied. Now, that being said, uh, you'll also be getting my personality as I deliver this presentation. And I always tell people you want to put that to the side as much as you can and you want to focus on the information only and the veracity of that information. So if you are a person who considers themselves easily effective, this presentation, easily offended, this presentation is not for you. And I make no bones about that. So none of my work at any point, at any time, anywhere you find my work is for the babies among humanity. None of it is for the babies. Okay, the easily offended, or in other words, those who don't really want to hear the hard truth spoken in an unapologetic way. If that describes you, and if you're a person who wants to cling to your beliefs, regardless of what the truth happens to be, then you shouldn't bother with this work right now. You should come back to it at a later time when you've matured enough, when you've matured to a state of mind that resembles psychological adulthood, true psychological adulthood. Then my work might have some positive impact on you. But if the mindset of easily offended describes you right now, you're probably wasting your time even watching this and trying to glean anything from it. And people will often say, Mark, why do you start your presentations harshly like that with people? They, they won't even want to watch it. Well, that's fine. I often disclose such a hardcore caveat before beginning my presentations, already knowing in advance that this might turn people away from even listening to what I have to say. And I do this not because I'm attempting to, uh, you know, get the wishy-washy on my, you know, I'm not attempting to get the wishy-washy on my side. I'm not attempting to be soft on people and get people just to watch it, okay? You know, if I really didn't care a lot about my work, I would, I would probably do something like that. You know, I would try to just get numbers. I want people who are ready to hear this who will accept the truth, not because I've said it, but because they've applied reason and critical thinking skills to what's being talked about, so that they themselves can arrive at the correct conclusion. And I, I you know, explain this to people because, you know, you may be the people who, you know, can hear it like that, you can hear it said in a harsh way, but you've just not discovered this information up until the current point. You, you have only now come across anybody telling you the truth like this. That's who I'm putting it out there for. I'm not putting it out there for people who aren't ready to accept it, don't want to know it, etc. If you're that kind of person, you know, go back to sleep and, you know, uh, this probably isn't going to do much for you. But I also put this truth out into the world in this way because this acts as a fulfillment of my own personal moral obligation to speak the truth that I have learned in the tyrannical times in which we live, which are rapidly growing more tyrannical. So let's begin this presentation today with basic definitions. Definitions exist for a reason. Words have meanings. And uh, let's uh, break down some basic definitions of terms that will be used throughout uh, this presentation. So when we talk about anarchy, what do we actually mean? What is meant by anarchy for the duration of this presentation? The English word anarchy is derived from the Greek prefix an. They're written in Greek 
uh, print in parentheses there. And the, the prefix and means without, the absence of, not present. And then the second part of the word anarchy comes from the Greek noun, archon. They're written in Greek in parentheses there, in Greek characters. And archon means ruler or master in ancient Greek. So when we put these together, we arrive at the term an archon, the absence of rulers, the absence of masters, without rulers, without masters. Anarchy does not mean without rules. Those who think that it means without rules or anything goes do not know what real anarchy is. Anarchy as a word literally means from its etymological origins without rulers. So anarchy means no rulers, no masters, or in other words, the state of true freedom where one is not ruled by others through violence, coercion, or duress. And that is, in fact, what I call the real world definition of anarchy. The real world definition is a state of existence in which individuals are not ruled or enslaved by others and are free to exercise their natural rights unrestrained by violence, duress, or coercion. This state of human existence, the state of existence in general, can only be created and maintained via behavioral alignment to objective morality through a deep understanding of natural law. So, most people will not give you this anarchy even in the anarchist community. uh, Sorry, will not give you this definition even within the anarchist community or the freedom community because they don't understand how anarchy is created. They don't understand, in other words, how true freedom, which is what anarchy is, is created in in our world. So as I said there, the state of anarchy can only be created and maintained via behavioral alignment to objective morality, meaning choosing and aligning one's behavior with actions which do not initiate harm to other sentient beings. And you can only do that through a deep understanding of natural law. So the real world definition of anarchy is that freedom can only be created when the population behaves in a moral capacity. Morality is the actual dynamic that creates freedom. That is what anarchy really is. If we're being honest with ourselves and if we are correct and we have the correct definition, that is the correct definition of what anarchy really is. It's not just the state whereby people are not ruled. It is the state by people are not ruled because they have aligned their behavior to objective morality under natural law because they themselves understand the dynamic that morality is what creates freedom. That is my definition of anarchy, and that is the correct definition of anarchy. That is what anarchy actually is in the realm of nature. In the real world, matter of fact realm of nature, that is what anarchy is and how it operates, whether anyone understands it or agrees with that definition or not. That is the definition of what anarchy actually is. So when we're talking about natural law, what do we mean by that statement? Well, first, it doesn't mean Darwinism. It doesn't mean survival of the fittest. It doesn't mean the natural order as postulated by Darwinism and those who think like that, you know, as a dog-eat-dog world. That is not what natural law is. So what is natural law as we are talking about it here in this presentation? Natural law is a set of universal, inherent, objective, non-man-made, eternal and immutable conditions which govern the consequences of behaviors of beings with the capacity for understanding the difference between harmful and non-harmful behavior. Yes, that's a mouthful, but if we take it in turn, universal means everywhere existent in the universe. Inherent means it is in in nature. It is not created by anything that is done by human beings or any other beings. It is inherent to nature. It is objective, meaning it is not subjective and open to interpretation or open to uh, the, you know, uh, whether we want to believe in it or not. It is not open to, um, you know, our opinion or whim. It is objective. It exists external to perception. It is non-man-made. It's not created by humanity. It exists because creation exists. It exists inherently in the universe. It exists as part of nature. It is eternal. It can never be out of effect. It has been in in effect since the beginning of the universe, and it will be in effect for as long as the universe exists. 
and it is immutable. These conditions are immutable, these laws. That means that they can never be changed by anyone or anything. Any process that anyone tries to undertake, they can never be changed because they are set in place by creation itself. So that's what we're talking about. And uh, these conditions govern the consequences of behaviors. They are the laws of behavioral consequence, karmic laws, cosmic universal moral laws, the laws of God, whatever you want to word it as. You can word it any way you want, but that is what they are. They are the laws that govern the behavioral consequences of the behaviors that we as human beings choose. They apply to beings with the capacity for understanding the difference between right and wrong, the difference between harmful and non-harmful behaviors. The understanding of natural law is centered upon bringing our own conscience, our knowledge of the objective difference between right and wrong behavior, into alignment with objective morality, the objective difference between behaviors which do initiate harm to other sentient beings and those which do not initiate harm, harm to other sentient beings. So this means definitively knowing which behaviors are which, which behaviors are rights because they do not initiate harm to others, and which behaviors are wrongdoings, are transgressions against natural law because they do initiate harm to other sentient beings. This is what we mean by what natural law is and how it operates in the world and why it is so important that human beings know what natural law is and the difference between harmful and non-harmful behavior. If we don't have that as a framework of knowledge under our belt, we can never create true freedom because true freedom is hinged upon behaving in, in harmony with natural law, behaving in harmony with objective morality. That is what creates freedom. So this is the natural law of freedom, as I call it. When human beings in the aggregate meaning in the collective sense as a species, live in harmony with natural law and are therefore moral, they become and remain free. When human beings in the aggregate live in opposition to natural law and are therefore immoral, they become and remain enslaved. I personally refer to this dynamic of natural law as the law of freedom. Or in other words, as aggregate morality increases, aggregate freedom increases. And as aggregate morality declines, freedom declines. The aggregate freedom of the whole species declines as aggregate morality declines. This is how natural law functions in the real world. This is a real world definition of the law of freedom and how it works in our world. Most anarchists do not understand this. Most human beings do not understand this and refuse to accept it. And that's why we're in the situation that we're in as a species. That's why we're going into total tyranny and abject slavery. Right versus wrong is the entire crux of the matter. So a right, as we defined it in the last slide, is a an action that does not initiate harm to another sentient being. True anarchy can only manifest when whole populations align their behavior to natural law, the universal moral laws of creation. Therefore, anarchy can only be created through a correct understanding of objective morality. If you do not understand objective morality, you cannot create the state of anarchy. It is an impossibility. Right behavior is also that which is correct. That is why it is so important to get it right, to be correct about our definitions and our understanding about these dynamics. Right does not just mean moral, it means correct as in based in truth, that it is not incorrect, that it is not wrong as an answer, okay? You know, when asked the, the correct, uh, the right qu question, you want to get the answer correct, this is the exact same thing. This is why we are talking about it. it is so important to have the correct answer about what generates freedom. So right not only means moral, it means correct. And of course, as we've already talked about, it means moral in the sense that actions which are in harmony with natural law, because they are rights, do not initiate harm to other sentient beings. Whereas if we are wrong, both incorrect not having the correct answer, not being based in truth, our actions will go awry and become immoral actions, which are in opposition to natural law because they do initiate harm to other sentient beings. For more information on natural law, the law of freedom, the difference between right and wrong, 
uh, you know, the transgressions against natural law, you know, questions about any given behavior. I highly recommend people check out my natural law seminar. Obviously, we can't repeat the whole seminar here today. I have to give the basics, you know, as uh, working definitions before we move on into further material. But if you want to look further into natural law, I did uh, a close to nine hour seminar on the topic called natural law, the real law of attraction and how to apply it in your life. And if you haven't seen that, you absolutely need to. That is my magnum opus. That is the absolute heart of all of my work. Okay, so let's move on to what it means to be an anarchist in name only. And this is very important. I uh, gave a presentation called Fake Ass Christians back in 2017, which I'll, I'll be mentioning, that talked about what is a Christian in name only. You know, it's somebody that is pretending to be something. They're inauthentic. They're a fake. They're uh, saying one thing, but then their behavior betrays what they're saying that they are. So let's look at this dynamic, because I don't think many people really understand when you use the term in name only what you mean. The phrase in name only means not the real thing. You know, mo many people may have heard this in political circles, uh, Republicans in name only, Democrats in name only. You know, I used it in the sense of Christians using the term in name only. And here I'm using it to mean anarchists in name only. Uh, there are people who uh, are wearing a mask as seen in the depiction there. Anyone can claim to be something, but in reality... If that person's thoughts and behaviors do not align with what they claim to be, they're most certainly not what they claim to be. They are, in fact, inauthentic beings. They are fakes. They are frauds. But sadly, most people fail to understand this dynamic or recognize that it is taking place in just about every aspect of human life. Just because someone says that they are something, and then maybe they want to take the symbols of that you know, movement or that dynamic or that philosophy and use it as their own doesn't mean they're that thing. Anybody can slap an A in a circle on themselves, call themselves an anarchist and not be an anarchist. Just like anyone that, anyone can hang a Christian cross pendant around their neck and not represent what Christianity is supposed to represent. The same is true for anarchists and anarchy in general. So just because someone says they're something doesn't automatically make them that, nor should we trust that they are that. Again, by your deeds, you shall know them. That's the whole point. Understand what people are behaving like. That is what they are. That is what they are bringing forth and manifesting in the world. They're manifesting the world through their behaviors, not what they say they are. Okay? So that's very important to keep this in mind as we step through the presentation. To understand, these are people just claiming that they're anarchists. Even they may believe that they are, but they do not have the correct understanding of anarchy in their own minds. And so their behaviors are going to go awry and go askew and often even be immoral. Okay? And they could advocate for immoral things. And that is because they are claiming to be something, but they don't even in their own minds often have the correct definition. That's why that definition section at the beginning of this presentation is so important to get correct. And those are the correct definitions. Okay? You know, it's not my opinion about the definitions of those things. That's how they really are in the real world of nature, and that's how they really work in the natural domain. So, moving forward, we're talking about people who just are using the word anarchy, basically. They're using the word in an incorrect capacity, and then they'll even use the symbol in an incorrect capacity, which is one of the reasons I say we need to take back the word anarchy, and we need to take back the symbol of anarchy, and we need to apply it to what it really means, not what other idiots out there are claiming that it means, and living a completely inauthentic life, uh, you know, with a mask on, pretending to be something that they are absolutely not, that they don't even understand in most cases. So again, I gave a presentation back in 2017 called Fake Ass Christians, where I exposed people who are Christian in name only and claim to be Christian, yet they're not really living the words of Jesus in the New Testament. They're not living uh, any type of authentic uh, Christian life. 
You know, they're just claiming to be Christian. I call it churchianity. It's one of the terms I applied to it in this presentation. Or, or Constantinianity after Emperor Constantine who unified Christianity under, you know, the banner of the Roman Empire. You know, again, anybody can call themselves anything. There's, there's Freemasons in name only. Okay? There's Rosicrucians in name only. There's Kabbalists in name only and occultists in name only. They don't really have the core principles. They don't have the core philosophy down, but they call themselves whatever they want to call themselves, even though they don't understand it fully and live it fully. The same is true for anarchists. So let's talk about who the fake-ass anarchists are. Now, I am going to delve into, in this presentation, the types of hyphenated anarchy, but not as much as you might think, okay? This presentation, one, is going to be a significant amount of review of philosophy, of morality, of natural law, and helping people to understand why this is so important to understand it, get it right, and really apply that to anarchy. That's the core philosophy of real anarchy. But I am going to spend a little bit of time on the fake anarchist factions. It is important enough to at least understand what the factions are, what they call themselves, and what their basic ideologies are. However, I am not going to delve into their, uh, in, in a great extent, to a great extent, into their 3D worldly philosophies. What I'm really going to get into is what their whole psychological makeup and their ideologies that go even beyond political ideologies really are. Okay? I'm going to go into what has completely led them askew and astray of real anarchy. All the ways that they are under mind control. All the ways that their thought process is actually leading them into a deeper state of bondage and enslavement instead of toward real freedom, which is what they claim they want. So this section is called, in double quotes, anarchist factions, and hyphenated, and in double quotes, anarchism. Okay, because they're not really these things. They just claim that they're these things. So let's look at some different categories of anarchists. I'm not going to take the time to break down uh, totally slide by slide each separate faction. I'm kind of grouping them into what I consider uh, large uh, categories of factions. Okay. So first and foremost, you have the left-wing anarchists. These are the most prominent of the fake anarchists, at least among the community of people who sort of does really understand what anarchism and anarchy really is all about. Uh, the, these, this is like the most popular aspect of fake anarchy, the left-wing branch of so-called anarchism. It's not anarchy, folks. It's not anarchism. This is, this is anarchism wrapped in double quotes. Please wrap it in a healthy dosage of double quotes, okay? So, the examples, and as I've uh, also, even in their names, like anarcho-communism, anarcho-syndicalism, etc., I am wrapping the word anarcho in double quotes to express this is a completely false uh, representation of what anarchy is. So, some examples of the left-wing factions of anarchy are anarcho-communism, anarcho-syndicalism, black bloc anarchists, so-called anarchists, and, of course, the uh, ever-present and popular Antifa, standing for anti-fascism, anti-fascist, which they're nothing of the sort either. So some of the ideologies of these types of left-wing anarchist factions include, but are not limited to, the following ideologies. Marxism, socialism, communism, and going hand in hand with those, the abolition of capitalism, the abolition of private property, the abolition of wage labor, so-called collective ownership. I put ownership in double quotes because if something is collective ownership, it's not owned. Uh, only the, the person who is deciding what can be done with property is the actual owner. So you can't really have collective ownership. Uh, but they want collective ownership of the means of, productions, of production of goods and services which really means you're handing it to the state at any given time. Collective ownership would be mob rule mentality. And this is often the mentality of leftists in general, certainly of so-called left-wing anarchism. 
overall, you know, all of these different factions or categories of anarchists that I'm going to be talking about here today, they believe that something is the problem that isn't really the problem. They just believe that in their own minds. They have this thing that they attack, that they want destroyed, that they want abolished from the world, and they believe that abolishing it will create true freedom. Well, in the left-wing fake anarchist uh, faction, uh, they believe that capitalism is the real problem and that abolishing capitalism will create true freedom. It's a, it's a ridiculous ideology. Uh, it's based in things that are actual um, slavery and uh, totalitarian uh, leading ideologies, ideologies that lead to total control over a whole society, lead to totalitarianism like Marxism, com- communism, socialism, etc. Uh, and they don't have an understanding of rights. You know, they identify themselves as Marx tried to identify human beings with as workers. Imagine this is your life's goal. This is what you want to identify yourself as. And we're going to talk about identification, identity politics, uh, identity uh, personalities, you know, um, just uh, pure ego identification of identifying with a role or with a group. And uh, they're poster children for that dynamic. And once again, uh, anybody identifying on this side of anarchy, uh, get as offended as you like by what I'm saying here. You can get as offended as you like, it's still not going to make what I'm saying untrue. Uh, Conversely, I'm going to go and start to attack the right-wing factions of anarchy next. Uh, They could feel as equally free to get as offended as they like. What I'm going to say about that will also be true, and you could get as offended about it as you want, and it will never make it untrue. So, you know, this stems out of left-wing partisan politics, and uh, these people uh, believe that they've transcended that, yet they've adopted some of the same uh, mentalities, ideologies, uh, you know, political thoughts that uh, have uh, basically led to the uh, decimation of whole populations and uh, the genocide of, uh, you know, over uh, 200 million people in uh, the last century alone. But, you know, uh, they want to believe that, you know, they're accurate and they've identified with something that is good and pure and wholesome. Uh, you know, they'll never be tr- it'll never be true. They'll never be correct about it. But yet, you know, they have bought into it. They've made it their identity. And part of what I'm going to talk about here today is uh, admission that you're wrong about something. Um, most people in any of these factions are never going to want to do that. They want to insist that they're correct and they got it and they learned all the information they need to know. And let me tell you something, little boys and girls, you don't have enough information. You got off the train before it even left the station when information is concerned, okay? You think you have the world figured out. You don't have anything figured out. You have a little pissant droplet in the bucket, okay? That's what you got, all right? Your, your little children in your mentality thinking that Marx is some kind of a savior when he's leading you into a total cage. You know, that's what's really going on. You know, you're being groomed for bondage and groomed for chattel slavery. Okay, because you think you have it figured out. You think you studied enough. You think you learned the answers. You didn't learn shit. Okay, you're still little children that haven't even gotten past the preface of the book, let alone read the whole thing. Let's put it that way. And you have a lot to learn and a lot of growing to do to understand how it really works. Because your spiritual children, your spiritual infants, in your understanding of how things really work in the real world. Infants. And you can't admit that to yourself. You can't admit that you don't have enough information. You know, it's part of the dynamic I'm going to talk about later. But these people identify with left-wing factions like socialism and communism and actually believe those are good things. They actually believe that concentrating the production of goods and services into the hands of the state or into the hands of the collective, as they claim, is somehow going to lead to freedom. You know, private property, private means of production, uh, you know, free markets, that to them, that's anathema, you know, and that's what they want to abolish, And they actually believe that'll lead to freedom. Believe it or not, some of those people are so dumb, they actually believe that will lead to true freedom. As fake as the day is long, ladies and gentlemen, you know. But good luck telling them that. 
You know, they're, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to listen. They want to believe that they're right, and they want to play grown-up when, in fact, they're infants. You know, here's some more uh, people who have gone a little bit further in their understanding, but not all the way. This is close, but no cigar. You know, set up uh, the, the tent three-quarters of the way up the mountain and uh, forget reaching the summit. Right-wing anarchism. Some examples, and again, this I'm not talking about any just one faction. These are general breakdowns of, of um, you know, uh, categories of uh, so-called anarchists. And again, if people thought that I was going to go easy on uh, the ANCAPs, uh, think again, because they don't have the understanding down either. They think that they do, and they have a long way to go in their understanding. So, you know, some of the, you know, anarcho factions here are anarcho-capitalism, voluntarism, agorism, etc. Their ideologies include free market economics, voluntary interaction, and freedom of association. And not that those things are bad, all right? That's a good start. Uh, I basically believe in those things as well. I don't identify with these groups. You know, one could call me a voluntarist, but I'm not talking about the voluntarist in the political sense that a lot of the people who identify with these groups and symbols do, because I understand that natural law is the only way that true freedom can be created, not just voluntary interaction alone, and under a deep understanding of natural law as inherent to creation and as really the laws of creation and the laws of God, if you will. So... They believe uh, free markets and voluntary interaction alone will create true freedom. I think it involves much more than that. I call this ideology close but no cigar. You got some of the basic things right, like the non-aggression principle, free markets, you know, voluntary interaction. You got that right, right? But I call this the close but no cigar factions of anarchy of anarchism because natural law and spirituality is almost always left out of the discussion. Okay? They leave natural law and spirituality out of the discussion because they don't want to sound like they're a religion. Natural law isn't a religion. Spirituality isn't a religion. You can be spiritual and religionless. You can understand natural law and be religionless. I consider natural law a science of morality, not a religion. So a lot of these groups are also atheistic and materialistic, purely political, purely financial. That's why they are they don't get it all the way. They're not real anarchists, in my opinion. And in my definition, I would not group these people as real anarchists. As difficult as that may be for some people out in the listening audience to hear, and as much as you might get offended at that statement, then go right ahead and get as offended as you want. It's still true. This isn't real anarchy. It's very close to what real anarchy is, but it misses the mark because the people who subscribe to these because they are secular, worldly, materialistic, only want to talk about financial and political power. They never want to talk about natural law and true spirituality. And that's why they're never going to get to an understanding of how real freedom is generated. They don't understand the generative principle. They don't understand aligning one's conscience with natural laws of morality is the only path to freedom. And that can sound dogmatic. You could say, I'm dogmatic about that all you want. But guess what? Gravity works a certain way. Electromagnetism works a certain way. All the laws of nature and dynamics work a certain way, and so do the laws that that uh, govern behavior of human beings. They work a certain way, and there's either knowing it or not knowing it. You, the, you have either identified how the dynamic operates, and you know it, or you don't know how the dynamic operates, and you're ignorant of it. Those who know it can align their behavior to it and get the result that they want, if enough people do that, and those who don't know it, whether whatever reason they're ignorant of it for, they are going to c continue to create unconsciously and get results that they do not want. That is how it really works in the real world, and right-wing anarchism is just as guilty as any other factions. So, sorry to burst people's bubble on that, but what I just said there is the truth. And you got to look into it way deeper than the levels that you're looking into this as, as just a political and financial, uh, you know, mechanism. You're just uh, uh, analyzing the political and financial machinisms. You know, you're never going to get to the heart or the crux of what's really going on by looking there. 
You got to get to the spiritual heart of it. You got to get to the moral heart of it. If you don't get to those levels of understanding and understanding these are laws that are set forth by a higher power than humanity, you're never going to understand the dynamics that generate true freedom. You'll get close. You'll get like, it'll be like a religion. This will be like almost like some religious, traditional religious dogma that can get people to an understanding, a basic understanding of morality, where they'll be like the kind of pe people that are like, I treat people nice and kindly and don't do bad things to people because Jesus said so, right? This is like that to what religion is to real morality, right? To a real understanding of natural law, one needs no religion. If one has a deep, real understanding of natural law, okay? You know, uh, and th this is like the anarchists that are like the Christians who say, I won't do b bad and evil things just because I don't want to go to hell, right? They, they, they have a, a very rudimentary understanding of basic morality, but it's lacking in many ways. And the same is true for a lot of these groups, sadly. Not all of them. You know, some people within these groups get it, but they're just still identifying with the group dynamic of hyphenated anarchy. Instead of understanding there's only anarchy with no hyphenations that is based on natural law. There is nothing else other than that in nature. All of these things I'm explaining here in this factions section, these are just constructs that exist in the mind. These are groupings and constructs that exist only in the human mind. The form of anarchy that I'm talking about, that I defined in the definition section, that one exists in nature. That's the real state of existence that exists within the natural world that we want to get back to. That really is the only true state of, of, of nature that human beings should be living in. Yet we have created the illusion, through the illusion of our belief in authority, we have created slavery for ourselves instead of the freedom that is the natural state called anarchy of no rulers. Let's move on to the next faction or category I really should call this. These are categories of fake ass anarchists. I call this this category the left brained anarchists. This is left brained anarchism. Some of the examples of the left brain anarchists are anarcho egoism, anarcho transhumanism. Yes, there is such a thing. Their ideologies include, but are not limited to, pure egotism, might makes right mentality, Newtonian materialism, transhumanism, and many other ideologies. You know, replacing parts of human beings with technology like a cyborg. They are driven by scientism and left brain imbalance. So here the dynamic that I'm really talking about is these are left brain imbalanced people. They are people who are completely trapped in ego mentality, in uh, physical world identification, in might makes right mentality, in materialism, in secularism, and in pure, you know total technology used in an out of control way for purposes that it is not intended. So they are driven by that type of left brain imbalance. They often display a lack of morality and almost entirely display a lack of spirituality, a total lack of spirituality. These different left brain factions, regardless of what they are, believe that either selfishness and or technology will create true freedom. See, there's always something that needs to go and then something that needs to be fostered, right? So like in the left brain, the left uh, wing factions, political left wing factions think that capitalism needs to go and shared ownership needs to be implemented of everything, right? This left brain anarchist faction uh, believe that selfishness is going to get us there. Replacing humanity with technology is going to get us there to true freedom. You know, human beings basically need to go to the wayside and technology needs to replace them. That's the anarcho-transhumanist mentality. You know, the anarcho-egoism is, it's, it's all just purely egoic and individual identifying and nothing is above the self. There are no laws higher than the self. Everything is just toward the self, the self, me, me, me. And it's my, my rights because I say there, it is this way. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. Anarcho egoism could be called Satanism for all intents and purposes. It's basically the same mentality and that's not going to get you to true freedom. That's going to get you exactly where we're at now in a cage, in a world of slavery and bondage. You know, living a life that's purely egoic like that. 
let's move on. So now we have the right-brained factions of anarchism. Converse to the left-brain factions. Uh, these people are highly in right-brain imbalance in their mentality and ideologies. Some examples are, are include but are not limited to anarcho-primitivism and anarcho-pacifism. And, uh, you know, I, uh, just like left-brained factions of anarchy, I completely am in disagreement with the right-brained factions. There is equally imbalanced and equally wrong. You know, there, there's no less shortage of being incorrect about what freedom, how freedom is generated, what needs to go, what needs to stay. They're all just completely wrong. That's the whole problem. You didn't figure it th you didn't follow through the logical steps of the trivium process enough to get it actually right, figure out what does create true freedom and then align yourself to that truth. You just followed through with what you already thought was going on in your own head and then you bought into the faction that, you know, pleased your pre-existing thoughts and whims. That's how this often works, okay? So you know the, their ideologies include, but are not limited to, to, are not limited to total rejection of technology, the abolition of all land ownership, and the rejection of the self-defense principle, as is the case with anarcho-pacifism, which I consider a completely deplorable ideology. Self-defense is one of the two pillars of natural law. Understanding it's one of the two pillars of true spirituality. You can't understand the non-aggression principle and not understand the self-defense principle if you really want to get both of them right. Non-aggression principle is do not initiate harm to other sentient beings. The self-defense principle is when harm is initiated against yourself or others, you have the right to defend yourself with physical force up to and including deadly force to stop that aggression. Very simple absolutely true principles that cannot be left at the door and cannot you can't not understand them in their fullness if you're going to be a true anarchist. They have to be deeply understood in their completeness and fullness, the two uh, pillars of enlightenment, which are the two pillars of anarchy, the non-aggression principle and the self-defense principle. That is, those are the pillars of natural law. And again, these people in these factions of right-brained anarchism, so-called, believe the technology and or self-defense must be abolished to create true freedom. So to them, living in nature without any technology is the answer, you know, and technology is the enemy, that's the devil, and that's what must be abolished, you know, and, and you know, in the case of the anarcho-pacifists, uh, any physical use of force is the enemy and must be abolished, including defensive force. They would never lift a finger to defend themselves, even if a, uh, you know, conscienceless, um, you know, ruthless enemy were at the gates, you know, and that's a completely deplorable self-loathing ideology that both of these things stem from being two in the right brain, you know, not enough balance in left and right brain hemispheres. These people are completely in the right brain, you know, don't want any technology and or won't stand up for themselves. So you could see how different forms of imbalance lead people into di different factions. The right brain go into factions like this. The left brain go into transhumanist and egoist. And then the left and right wing political factions, they break down the same way based on brain imbalance. It's all imbalance within the self. Speaking of which, let's look at the next one, which is what I call no-brained anarchism. Well, we had left brain and right brain. This is what I call no-brain anarchism because these people are total fucking idiots, okay? These are uh, people who think that anarchy means chaos. They're, they're people who bought into the notion that the PSYOP mainstream media told them anarchy means chaos, and then they believe that's a good thing. Okay, because they don't want to be ruled by other people, and they, they actually believe we should just have chaos, you know? They're nihilists, they're little spiritual infantile children is what they really are. So the example are nihilist anarchists, you know, people who believe in nothing and are proud of that, you know. Oh, I represent nothing, I believe in nothing. It's just all, everything's here for, that is, everything is purposeless. The universe is purposeless. There is no point in even believing in anything. I mean, what a fool's mentality. Well, a child, it's a child, it's not a man's mentality, it's not a woman's mentality. It's a little bratty child with their arms crossed, like, 
that that's what that's what this really is. That's what almost really all of these anarchist factions are. It's really the, the hallmarks of people who never grew up into actual psychological human adulthood. Human psychological adulthood. They never got there. That's what it really is. Okay? You know, and you know, people will be like, Oh, you're you're calling people names, Mark. Yeah, I'm calling them names because that's what they deserve. Anybody this stupid to believe that anarchy is chaos at this point in the year 2021 and still identifying with that and thinking it's a good thing and thinking you're going to get real freedom like that is a fucking idiot. It's not just me being being mean or condescending. It's those things too, but if they really are idiots, you know, they really are mentally challenged human beings. And I'm not here to be nice to people, you know. You know, part of psychological adulthood is... is understanding the truth and speaking it. It isn't necessarily being super nice to everybody when they're an idiot and they're affecting other people's lives for the negative. That's the whole problem is that too many people don't want to tell people you're just an idiot. You got to rethink it. You haven't thought it through well enough to come to the correct answer. And that's what it really is. And often it's because these people have no parenting. They had shit for parents, absolute shit for parenting, or they had no parents. And, and they never had a mentor. They never studied enough to really develop a mentor, like an author as a mentor or a presenter as a mentor. And they just had no good um, way showing, you know. Uh, absolutely nobody really took them under their wing ideologically, phil- philosophically, and showed them the way, showed them the correct way, the correct path. You know, that's why people think like this. So some examples are nihilists and what's called anarcho-immoralists, anarcho-immorality. Yes, there's such a thing. Look it up. Their ideologies include rejection of the non-aggression principle. Yeah, that, that'll get you to true freedom. That's great. No, that's exactly what's going on now. That's what we have now in the world. That's why we're enslaved now, because of the rejection of the non-aggression principle. The uh, ideology of the ends justifies the means. The total rejection of morality, nihilism, and in the embrace of chaos. I mean, imagine how completely mentally challenged people would have to be to believe this. And to believe this is anarchy and then call it anarcho, hyphenated, whatever. They're spiritually stunted children. And this state is really pretty much what we have now. We have the total rejection of the non-aggression principle, ends justifies the means, rejection of morality, chaos. That's what we have now, really. This is, this is the mentality of the rulers of the world. And then these idiots burning down property actually believe they're going to get freed up from the occultists who run the world. Yeah, you're, go- you're going to be free of them with their mentality at a lower scale. They're they're ultra high level geniuses operating with this mentality and you're total fucking idiots operating down here with this level of mentality, but you're going to be free from them. Sure. Sure you are. But uh, this imbecilism pretty much sums up the current human condition. This is what idiots out there believe. They're just as big of idiots as people who are hardcore, rabid, religious statists. It's just the opposite end of the spectrum. That's all it is. And finally, we have what I call those who have sold their soul anarchism. And they're not anarchists at all. They're actually who I just mentioned. People who have totally given their heart and mind over to the state, but then wear a costume and then an anarchist badge, an A in a circle badge, and say, I'm an anarchist, and then they go out and destroy property as an agent provocateur. So these are agent provocateurs, or in other words, what I call them, low-life cops with trash for parents. Low-life cops with a scumbag, rotten, low-life set of parents, you know, who never taught them morality, who never taught them the difference between right and wrong, who sat them down in front of the television and let the TV raise them and they became a crooked cop, you know, a scumbag with no morality. Their ideology is government and money are my gods, so I'll do anything no matter how low or immoral to serve them. I'll go out in the middle of the anarchist group, you know, so-called anarchist faction that's protesting, you know, and I'll throw some bricks or a chair or a bench through a window of, of of a corporate business to try to make the anarchists in the street look bad and look like they're people who just destroy property randomly. 
That's all agent provocateuring it is. You pick your political opponent. You say, who, who does the chief want us to go and g- give a bad name to today? That's all they give a damn about, you know? And then they'll go out on the street and cause chaos. And it's, a, it's called agent provocateuring. It's a French term that basically means you're pretending to be your political enemy and then you're doing behaviors that make them look horrible so that they can be, uh, you know, um, politically attacked. And you could make them look bad. You're destroying their reputation. You're demonizing them. These kind of people are who I call pure evil in human flesh, the lowest form of consciousness in the known universe, according to me. There's nothing lower than a cop to begin with, let alone you put a cop in a uniform pretending to be an anarchist, doing his, following his orders from his higher ups to destroy other people's property, just to get that tag placed on anarchy so that the public through the mainstream media believes that this is what anarchists do. When this isn't what anarchists do, making presentations like this is what anarchists do, to expose this and present the truth. That's what a real anarchist does. So for the duration of the presentation, what I'm going to talk about is the mentality that all of these groups have in one form or another, folks. See, it's less about identifying just the group and then talking endlessly about, oh, here's what the group does, here's what they think, here's here's who their funders are. I'm not interested in those three 3D worldly things. Uh, to a certain extent, I am. I want to learn about it. I want to know it. But this is not what is going to help us to get out and obtain true freedom. This is not going to help us to get out of slavery. We have to understand where these people went awry in their thinking, because it does comprise a big portion of people. And if we help them to understand where their thinking went wrong, then we can help them to come over to the true side of real anarchy. That is possible with a lot of work. So this section is what I call religion, the one, still the one and only problem. So let's look into how this dynamic works. As I've said endlessly throughout my work and in many former presentations, religion is the problem. You know, people hear me speak about natural law as God's law. They'll hear me, you know, uh, mention the the words of Jesus in the New Testament as a uh, moral philosophy. That doesn't mean I'm religious, folks. I could take that as allegory. Okay, I don't need to believe in it as a religion. I'm against all religion, cultural or traditional religion, and otherwise. I'm against the religion of government, the religion of the belief in authority. I'm I'm against the religion of the worship of money, etc. I'm against all these religions. I'm against the religion of solipsism. I'm against the religion of postmodernism. I'm against the religion of radical neo-feminism. You know, all of these things are religion that hold us back from where we say we want to go. Because that's what the word religion means. It's etymologically derived from the Latin verb religare. And religare in Latin means to bind, to hold back by tying, to thwart from forward progress. Religion is the head cage. It thwarts back our consciousness from forward progress. Thwarts us back from our understanding of what is true. Religion is a system of sociological control based in unchallenged and dogmatic, unchallenged, erroneous, and dogmatic belief, which is specifically designed to hold back the progress of human consciousness. Religion is there to stop us from understanding natural law, to stop us from understanding the law of freedom, to stop us from understanding how true freedom manifests in our world. The social engineers don't want us understanding those things. They want us in a complete lack of understanding of how natural law really functions. They want us in a lack of understanding of how true freedom is actually created in our world. They don't want human beings understanding those dynamics. So they give us religion. And even that's euphemizing the term. What it really is is mind control. Stop sugarcoating it and you know, uh, softening the language. It's not just religion. It's not just holding back consciousness. It's not just a clever marketing scheme or, you know, trying to get people swayed to your opinion. 
It's mind control. That's what it really is if we're being honest with ourselves. And that's what it does. It puts our brain in the cage, the head cage, the brain cage. That which is going to put those bars up and stop us from progressing outward to understand natural law. So, let's look at the religions of the fake anarchists. All those factions I just described, left wing, right wing, left brain, right brain, no brain, and soul sold. Okay? All of those six factions are categories of anarchists, of fake ass anarchists, right? All of those people who identify with being members of those groups or isms, right? All of them had their mind controlled in a certain way. All of them had their thoughts swayed in a certain direction. All of them lost the thread somewhere along the line. They lost the plot. Okay? And these are the religions. What I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the presentation is their religious dogma that is going on in their minds. Religion is their only problem. But what are their religions? This is what we really have to clearly identify, folks. What are the religions of the fake-ass anarchists? And the first and foremost religion that is common to all of them, that is common all the way across the board with all six of those categories of anarchists, is ego identification. Now, this is a term that I brought forward. Again, some of this is going to be a review. There will be a couple of things that I haven't presented before as we move forward, but this is review to a large extent. Because I presented about ego identification back when I first created What on Earth is Happening back in 2007 and 8. I gave lectures on ego identification as part of my first What on Earth is Happening series. And it's very important to understand what this is. It's a very critical dynamic. So this is a slide that I gave in What on Earth is Happening presentation number one. First ever presentation. I actually gave this presentation in my own home and it was uh, recorded by friends and then I gave it again at Germ Bookstore here in Philly, which is no longer there. That was uh, over a decade ago. And uh, this was my slide on ego identification. You know, you have the business suit guy who identifies with being, you know, a member of the, the company, company man. You have the Americans who identify with a a state, a nationality, a political ideology, perhaps. You have the guy in uniform, he identifies with being a soldier, or conversely, it could be a cop identifying with that, you know, being a police officer. You have the family members identified with their role in the family, husband, wife, child, etc. And these are all just suits and roles and masks that people identify with and, and wear for a time while they're alive, you know. Uh, that guy gets fired from that job. Is he still that uh, corporate, you know, uh, suit and tie guy? You know, um, you know, a, a divorce happens. Does the person still identify as husband or wife? That guy gets a dishonorable discharge from the service. Does he still identify as a soldier? It's a, for a time and a place. It's like a, it's like any other outfit that we wear, any other costume. That's all it is. That's what ego identification is. But when people become crystallized to that identity and I completely identify it as that's who I am, that's not a role that I'm participating in, then it becomes dangerous because that person is only going to think along those lines. And anything that contrasts with the little box that they've put themselves in is anathema and is not to be even considered. You know, that's what holds these people back from truth in many ways. They identify with, oh, I'm a cop, I'm a soldier. Anything that conflicts with that, I don't even want to hear or listen to. That's what makes it hard for them to absorb the truth. When it is spoken to them, they hear it as the enemy. Because, oh, that goes against my belief structure in my institution or organization. That's what ego identification is. So seeing the world clearly and perceiving the truth about any given matter relies to a great extent on being able to stop identifying with any particular institution, group, role, job, or even personal identity. We have to see ourselves as not even just an individual, but we need to see go beyond the skin suit layer of physical being and understand that we are an abstract of pure consciousness operating as a physical being in this reality. We are a spiritual being having a human experience in the 3D domain. 
That's true spirituality and an understanding of the higher self. The true identity as consciousness. And most people have never gotten there. They've never done the inner work to get there. They don't want to sit quietly in a room with their own the, the, their own thoughts and their mind and, and meditate and or just sit quietly with themselves and look in a mirror. God forbid, that's the last thing that they would want to do. You know, is be, be alone and quiet with themselves. Probably the person they hate the most in life. And yet say that they love themselves. You know, they're trapped inside of themselves. They're trapped in the roles that they have accepted. Often to appease someone else or for money or for a myriad of other reasons. But they're trapped in that barrier that is never going to let them become self-realized. Unless they break out of that cage that they've allowed themselves to be put into. They've allowed their infinite expanse of consciousness to be held prisoner in a tiny little box. That's what ego identification is. And this is where the fake ass anarchists are at. They identify with a tiny little aspect, a, a, a small institution, a uh, you know, an ism, you know, that feels comfortable to them. But they're not reaching higher self. They're not doing any internal work. They're all going along secular lines and secular roles, as we're going to talk about secularism being one of their religions. And they're totally locked into a 3D worldly ego identification role. And until they step outside of that and expand their consciousness hugely, they're never really going to understand true anarchy. They're going to stay identified with a nonsense definition of what somebody else told them anarchy was. But they're not going to understand the real thing. Their consciousness isn't expansive enough to even grasp it because of how much you would have to understand about the occult. You have to widen your worldview about the occult. Occultism and anarchy, the understanding of occultism and anarchy go hand in hand, folks. That's why I gave, you know, really three presentations on the topic at Anarchapoco. Anarchy and the occult part one and two, and then most recently the deadly pandemic that's killing anarchy. So let's move on. When one leaves the mind-controlled state of ego identification... That individual ceases to align themselves with relativistic roles in the program of human life and begins to align themselves with consciousness and truth itself. That's why I have no allegiance to any groups. I have no allegiance to any individuals. Not if they're standing in the way of natural law. If they're standing in in the way of the understanding of natural law, I have no allegiance to them. I, I, I help and will align myself with people who do understand natural law, who do understand freedom and are trying to create it. But first and foremost, I have aligned myself with truth itself. That's what I have an allegiance to. That's what I have a moral obligation to align myself with. Truth itself. So let's look at the next religion that these fake-ass anarchists have taken into themselves. And this is a twofold one. I call this section postmodernism and solipsism. Now, solipsism was something that I explained at the very beginning of What on Earth is Happening in the podcast series. And I'm, we're going to revisit it here today a little bit, but we're also going to incorporate the understanding of postmodernism into this. So, postmodernism. I'm giving the Wikipedia definition. I, I call it, I describe postmodernism postmodernism as decimating enlightenment everywhere. That's really what postmodernism is doing. The prevalence and propagation of postmodernism is just destroying people's ability to become enlightened being, beings, destroying their ability to spiritually awaken. That's why they're putting postmodernism into the modern outcome-based education system ideology. And, and hammering children over the head with it all day, every day in uh, institutions of so-called higher learning at the university level, colleges, high schools, it's everywhere. According to Wikipedia, the definition of postmodernism is this. Postmodernism is generally defined by an attitude of skepticism, irony, or rejection toward what it describes as the grand narratives and ideologies associated with modernism often criticizing enlightenment rationality and focusing on the role of ideology in maintaining political or economic power. In other words, don't bring forth rationality, 
r rational arguments, logic, true philosophy. We're going to make people take on ideology. Well, what does ideology be begin with? ID, right? Identification. Identification with a political power or economic power. So that this is where uh, identity politics comes from. It's really ego identification through postmodern thinking. That it doesn't matter about being right. Being right, oh, that's such an old notion. Don't worry about facts. Don't worry about being right. What do you feel about it? It's all feelings that determine what truth is to these people. And this is huge in the anarchist movement, believe it or not. Huge. All you got to do is do some social experiments and ask them. And a lot of them are postmodernists. Postmodern thinkers frequently describe knowledge claims and value systems as contingent or socially engineered, framing them as products of political, historical, or cultural discourses and hierarchies, meaning there is no real truth. Truth is relative. Oh, that's only seen as truth because the existing hierarchy or culture says it was so. No, my friends, there is such a thing as truth. Truth is not just relative or based on, uh, you know, somebody's uh, comfort level or feelings or whims or likes or dislikes or their perceptions of a thing. You know, that's what they're trying to frame as this is how people should think. Everything is relative. Like the like the poster here says, all truth is relative. And then it's got a star and then you read the star and it says, accept this statement. You know, that should show you how full of shit the ideology is. It's not even consistent with itself, you know. They'll say, oh, this is true, and then you're like, oh, well, is it? Is there such thing as true, or is that just what you feel, you know? Well, don't claim that something is true if it's all based on feelings and it, it could all be relative, because then nothing is true, you know? This is how inconsistent postmodernism is, just like solipsism. And this is what they want Everybody thinking like, because if you think like this, there's no such thing as truth, then of course, by definition, there's no such thing as morality, and then you go into the big destroyer of anarchy, which is what we're going to talk about soon. Because if, if people don't accept morality, they could never be free. They can't align their behavior with objective morality, and therefore align their behavior with natural law. Common targets of postmodern criticism include universalist ideas of objective morality. Again, they don't believe in objective morality. Universalist ideas of morality, truth, human nature, reason, science, language, and social progress. Basically, what they're saying there is they reject these notions. They reject that there is objective morality. They object, object sorry, objective reality. They object that there is objective morality. They um, object that there is objective truth. You know, I don't personally believe in human nature as, uh, you know, traditional culture defined it. I think of it as a programmable state that can be programmed for the good or can be programmed for the worse, for, for ill and evil. You know, but they don't believe in reason, re even real science. <laughs> They're against language, you know, because they don't want real definitions of words. They want a word to mean whatever they can make it to mean and flip-flop the word definition week by week if they so choose. And even social progress. Accordingly, postmodern thought is broadly characterized, listen to this, by tendencies to self-consciousness, and what they really mean there is solipsism, the belief that there only the self can exist, self-referentiality, epistemological and moral relativism, meaning that reality is relative and can be anything anybody wants it to be based on their feelings, and moral relativism, morality can be anything anybody wants it to be based on their feelings. That's what epistemological relativism and moral relativism is. Pluralism and irreverence. This is modern Postmodern thought. That's what it's called. Postmodern ideology. And it's a huge part of anarchist thinking. Fake anarchists. Even people who say that they're anarchists, you know, uh, and say that they're, oh, well, I'm a real freedom anarchist. A lot of them believe in this. A lot of them are still solipsistic and postmodern in their thinking. Hand in hand with postmodernism goes solipsism. Solipsism, 
as a word is derived from the Latin adjective solus, meaning alone, <clears throat> and the Latin pronoun ipse, meaning self. Solipsism is the ideology that only one's own mind is sure to exist. Solipsism, solipsists contend that knowledge of anything outside of one's own mind is unsure. Hence, there is no such thing as objective truth. And nothing about the external world and its workings can actually be known or communicated to others. Imagine this. They believe reality is contingent upon whether they believe something is true or not or are comfortable with its existence. Imagine being that egotistic. I mean, nothing, there can't be any more pure of a form of egotism than that. That reality works only because I say it works like that and I'm comfortable with it because it's based on my perception and there is no independent objective reality. Imagine believing that. Imagine having that high level of egotism. That is what solipsism is. The world revolves around my beliefs. It doesn't just revolve around me physically. It revolves around what I think. Because I may be the only one in existence and everything else may be an illusion. Imagine. This is what people are being taught, even in so-called anarchist communities. Fake-ass anarchists are often solipsistic, especially the left-wing uh, faction. And often the right-brain faction, which are often very similar to each other. Solipsism is both a false religion and a defining hallmark of spiritual infancy. Departing from this diseased ideology is a surefire sign of the beginnings of human maturity and spiritual development. Those who are truly awake fully understand that objective reality does exist and the truth can be known. Of course objective reality exists. You know, truth is that which is because it has undergone the formality of actually occurring in the physical domain. And we can know that truth exists. There are truth discovery methodologies that I'm going to talk about. Of course we can know whether something is true or not. Of course we can determine the real from the false. The real thing from the illusion. Of course we can. Sometimes it may not be easy. It could be difficult work, but it can be done. Another religion of the fake-ass anarchists is atheism and scientism. Two more religions. And these all stem from materialism, which we're going to talk about as a cause of some of these other religions. What the atheist so-called anarchists are doing is they're buying into polarization dialectics. Okay, And uh, let me tell you something, folks. Let me just state it here unequivocally. There is no such thing as an atheist anarchist. Sorry. Once again, get as offended as you like. Atheism is a religion. A true anarchist will have come out of and abandoned all actual religions. And atheism is just another religion, just like solipsism, just like scientism, just like materialism, just like secularism, just like postmodernism, just like communism, just like socialism. It does not matter. It's all religion. Atheism is just another religion that uh, is there to prevent people from understanding natural law. Natural law is not a religion. It is the way things really work in nature. There is a science to its understanding because it is knowledge. Knowledge of it is possible. Atheism is a belief system that there is no higher power in the universe than humanity. And all atheists are doing, they're left brain dominant individuals who are religionists in their own way, buying into the polarization dialectic of atheism versus creationism or atheism versus religionism. I'm neither an atheist nor a religionist. So pe that upsets people everywhere. You know, well, what else is there? There's somebody who understands the truth about human spirituality and the truth about how natural law fun functions in the world to create human freedom or human enslavement. That is what I am. I'm an occultist who studies that level of knowledge, who studies that objective reality and obtains the knowledge of how it works. And then I de-occult that information by teaching it to people. So if I want to identify with anything at all, I would say I am a deoccultist because I am obtaining the knowledge of how natural law works and teaching it to others. But let's look at the atheist prevailing worldview. It is that matter is primary and supreme, that God or spirit is non-existent, that the physical world is all there is, that 
only physical laws exist and no natural laws that govern behavioral consequences exist, that consciousness is either purely mechanical and electrical in the brain, or it is meaningless altogether and doesn't really exist that we're just uh, flesh robots, and that institutions of science are the sole arbiters of truth. There is no other truth discovery methods except that which uh, government grant money funded science approves of and publishes. Conversely, on the flip side of this polarization dialectic equation, you have the uh, religionist that is uh, just like the atheist, but just toward the opposite brain imbalance. They're right brain imbalance toward religion. Their prevailing worldview is that spirit is primary and God is all powerful, that the physical world is evil or should be ascetically shunned, that God demands strict human obedience to his arbitrary and often conflicting set of rules, that goals in the physical world should not be focused upon, but rather we should focus on the promised afterlife with God. That's the religionist mentality or worldview. And I have news for people on both camps, whether you fall into the atheist camp or the camp that believes in a religion uh, of any particular traditional religion and any savior for that matter, that when it comes to the dynamic of true anarchy, neither one of these is going to get you there. They're going to hold you back because they're both religious forms of thought, and they are just going to hold you back from an understanding of what creates real anarchy, which is bringing collective or aggregate behavior into alignment with natural law, objective morality. Morality creates freedom. That's the law of freedom. As morality increases, freedom increases. Neither one of these things is going to tell you that, folks. Religion is going to tell you, do what Jesus says to do, or do what Abraham says to do, or do what Moses says to do, or do what Allah says to do, or do what, uh, you know, um, Muhammad tells you to do. You know, it's good. that's all it's going to tell you. Follow what somebody else says to do. It's not going to tell you, obtain knowledge of how the laws of creation really work. Certainly the atheist isn't going to tell you that because he doesn't believe there's laws of creation that govern human behavior. Doesn't believe that there's universal laws about morality because it, the atheist doesn't believe in a higher power so both of these things they're not going to get you there they're not going to get you to true freedom that's why i say there is no such thing as an atheistic anarchist and there's no such thing as a religious anarchist let me state that again get as offended as you like it's true whether you accept it believe in it understand it or don't accept it it does not matter true statement Blanket statement, blanket, true, eternal statement. There is no such thing as an atheist anarchist. No such thing. Does not exist, never has existed, never will exist. According to what I'm putting forward as the definition of anarchy. Anarchy is not just the understanding that there should be no rulers, that no one should be ruling anybody else. It's how the state of freedom is created in the physical manifested 3D reality. And that only happens by aligning behavior to objective morality under natural law, which is put there by the creator of the universe. Those laws are not put there by man. They're not arbitrarily defined or constructed by man. Therefore, no atheist can be an anarchist, truly a true anarchist. They can make the claim to be an anarchist, but they're not really truly what that word truly means, what it is defined as. Morality creates freedom. And the, the true understanding of that comes through natural law and understanding that man is not the pinnacle of creation. There is a higher power than man that put natural law into effect, and we are bound by those laws of morality. Our state of freedom is hinged upon it and determined upon whether we, o we obey those laws in the aggre aggregate or we do not. Period. The end. And the second part of the statement, you, all people out there who identify with a re religion, you can get equally as offended about it all you like. There is no such thing as a religious anarchist. There is no such thing as a person who is a true anarchist that is also a true religionist meaning that they obey and identify with and believe in all the dogmas of a particular religion. One of these dialectics and polarities is equally as asinine as the other, as far as I'm concerned. So that that makes everybody hate me, go right ahead. Hate me, don't listen, turn it off, say that I'm wrong. No, you're wrong! 
You don't understand the dynamic. You're incorrect. You're under mind control. You're buying into the polarization dialectics. That's how it really is. In objective reality, that's how it really is. I'm not wrong. I'm correct. All the people who are atheists who believe that they could be anarchists are incorrect. All the religionists who believe that they could truly be anarchists, you're incorrect. That's how it really is. Get as offended as you like. See, all the imbeciles out there with this slogan, no gods, no masters, this comes largely from the left-wing factions of anarchy and the left-brain factions. These are... These anarchists using the slogan, no God, no masters, they're immersed in the polarization dialectic of atheism and scientism versus religionism. They fall on the side of atheism and scientism. Such dialectical programming is deliberately socially engineered by the ruling class, the occult ruling class, to prevent an understanding of true morality and natural law and to therefore prevent the emergence of true freedom. That is why that is out there to put out, there's no God, no gods, no masters. No, anarchy doesn't mean no gods. Atheism means that. Okay? Don't twist that up in what pure anarchy is. You know, this is a a hybridization of ideologies, atheism and anarchism. True anarchy is just no masters, no rulers. And an understanding of how you create that state of no masters, no rulers. You create that state by living morally. You create that state by living in harmony with objective morality under natural law. The non-aggression principle combined with the self-defense principle. Nobody ever said any part of no gods in the definition of anarchy. As a matter of fact, by definition, an anarchist must understand and accept the existence of a higher power that put natural law into effect. So this is a completely asinine, backwards, contradictory statement. No gods, no masters. Now, how about uh, starting with getting out of your ego? You know, get out of your ego first, thinking that you're the pinnacle of all creation in the universe and that there's no force higher than you. Please. You know. You're you're so full of yourself, you're going to burst and get the rest of us really filthy dirty with what comes out of you. Conversely, the second part of this left brain religion is scientism. So, so so-called anarchists and scientism. What is scientism? It's an exaggerated trust in modern scientific institutions to the extent that the individual extending such trust believes that these institutions are the only source of verifiable truth. Many anarchists still believe in such an institutionalized worldview of science, unfortunately. To a great extent, they also accept without question the completely outdated and disproven paradigm of Newtonian materialism, which goes hand in hand with this form of so-called science, what I'm calling scientism. Many within the so-called anarchist movement cannot grasp that true science is a methodology of truth discovery and not a belief system as dictated by modern worldly institutions. See, that's what science is today. Trust the science, believe the science. It's a belief system that is dictated by the worldly institutions of science that are all government grant money funded. True science is a methodological means of truth discovery. It's a very rigid science, it's a very rigid practical methodology by which we uncover and discover truth about anything. And it's called the trivium. Scientism, the trivium clears and makes way for our understanding of truth, whereas scientism clouds it. It clouds our understanding of truth and self. Because it's a belief system, it's a religion. Ignoring entire data sets and fudging data to fit their own deeply entrenched worldview are foundational hallmarks of government grant money funded scientism. The emerging emerging modern sciences of epigenetics and holistic biology, just two fields in this wider emerging field of modern science, are just now beginning to turn the tide against such a worldview by correctly incorporating consciousness and metaphysical understanding into their research methodologies. 
consciousness and natural law have to be incorporated into any given field of science. That's why in new biology, or what's now being called holistic biology, that is being incorporated. In the, the field of epigenetics, they're realizing that consciousness plays a role in the expressions of genes. And it's a fascinating field of study, which many people watching this should really look into. The next religion of fake anarchists is secularism. And this is pure worldliness and material identification. I talked about this, the five sense illusion, in uh, the original What on Earth is Happening series as well. But what this all boils down to is the absence of any form of spirituality in one's life. You talk to people who are secularists. You talk to people who are pragmatists only. You talk to people who are, um, you know, um, uh, very rigid, uh, you know, atheistic, scientific, uh, you know, believers in scientism, um, uh, people who are um, <clears throat> de bereft and devoid of any real sense of morality, I'm sorry, of spirituality in their lives. Not necessarily morality, they could potentially understand morality, but they don't have any basic framework for what put the laws of, mora of morality, the objective laws of morality, into effect in the 3D universe. You know, you ask them a question like that, they don't think that there's objective laws of morality in the universe. And then you, if you, even if you ask them, well, does karma exist? Does natural law exist? And they think it exists. You say, where is it? Where did it come from? Well, if it exists and you don't, can't explain any part of where it came from, do you really believe that it exists? They don't have any spirituality in their life. If you say the word spiritual to them, it's meaningless. If you say the word consciousness to them, it's meaningless. They believe in this pure 3D form of, of consciousness and only identification with the material world and the five senses. That's why they're going to have a hard time understanding real anarchy and a hard time understanding occultism especially. What is secularism? You know, it's being of this world. It's being identified with the flesh. It's being identified with pure physicality. And being of this world is not the answer. It will never get you to real anarchy. The word secular is derived from the Latin noun seculum, meaning world. Again, it's worldly identification. Almost all forms of, quote, anarchists, the fake-ass anarchists, place huge, place huge de emphasis on philosophy and spirituality and consciousness, and place a very strong emphasis on the analysis of worldly institutions and events. They erroneously believe, as an overarching aspect of their secular worldview, that political and economic solutions to the human condition of slavery even exist. There are no political and economic solutions to slavery. They continuously fail to recognize and acknowledge that the only true solution to the human condition of slavery is a spiritual solution. And that is the alignment of our behavior with objective morality and the principles of natural law. As I will say until the day I die repeatedly. But, you know, you can't make anybody understand it. They're hard-headed. They're trapped in their ego. They believe in physical world identification only. You know, what they really need is a consciousness annihilating, is a, is a, five, a 3D, five sense consciousness annihilating experience. They need a massive, massive, massive dose of DMT and then tell me that there's no spirit. You know, that's what they really need to get hit with. They need their ego hardened form of consciousness annihilated. They need an ego annihilation experience because that's how rooted in the secular domain they are. And they believe they're going to find that secular solution. You know, we just got to end the Fed, or we got to get the right political person in office, or, you know, uh, we got to, you know, make, get better effective methods of distributing uh, technology or food. It's like, none of these are the answer, folks. Going deep within and really understanding true spirituality, such that we be, become beings that no matter what we are, are offered... No matter how much money or power or fame we are offered or any other pleasure, we will not do immoral behaviors to our fellow beings. That's a spiritual solution, not a secular one. Another religion that people are trapped in that goes hand in hand with, you know, the, the secularism is material identification, you know, and um, <clears throat> no spirituality. 
So go, going hand in hand with no sense of spirituality in one's life because they're trapped in that secular state of mind, that secular mindset, is materialism. I call it the cornerstone of most forms of anarchism. So, you know, how many people just got involved in anarchy because, oh, I, I want government to have their hands off my money. I want the Federal Reserve to stop, um, you know, uh, devaluing my savings, and my money, the money supply. So I, I have, I could live more comfortably. How many people are all into the whole crypto aspect of the anarchist community, and that's all they're obsessed with? But that they very rarely even talk about the the philosophy, and especially the underlying spirituality of what anarchy really is. Too many, way too many people are in this mindset. I've met plenty of them myself. They're all just into materialism and money. You know, and a lifestyle. And anarchy is some sort of a lifestyle for them. This isn't a lifestyle. This is an entire worldview and mindset. It's not just something to graft onto because it seems cool at the time. And it will make you more money and you'll get involved in crypto. You know, this is a materialist worldview that too many people place as the, as, as the, the cornerstone. The foundation. This is a. This should be a uh, ancillary aspect of the anarchist movement, not the main part of it. The main part of it should be philosophical and spiritual, and aligning behaviors to morality. How many people really even talk about that? How many people, other than myself, have many people heard say, "Anarchy can only come about by aligning one's behavior to the spiritual laws of morality in the universe." You can count them on one hand, practically. <clears throat> it's certainly not the wide aspect of the movement, of the so-called anarchist movement. Most of them are materialists, because they're atheists. And you combine these five religions with you know, what I just referred to as religions, these five ideologies that underline Anarchy, so-called anarchy, the fake-ass form of anarchy. And they form what I call the perfect storm. You know, the inverted pentagram swirling like a tornado, the perfect storm to generate the ultimate murderer, the ultimate all-destroyer of anarchy. And I've said it many, many times. You put all of these together. You know, you build the foundation upon atheism, the belief that there's no higher power, and then scientism. Science is the only arbiter of truth. Scientific institutions, worldly scientific institutions, being the only arbiter of, of truth, right? No spirituality, pure materialism, leading to the ideologies of postmodernism and even solipsism. What does this bring forth into the world? This brings forth the juggernaut that has come to slay all anarchy. Moral relativism. This would be the heart. If these five corners are the points of the pentagram, if those five main overarching ideologies are the corners of the pentagram, moral relativism is its heart. That's the pentagon at the heart of the, pent of the, heart of the inverted pentagram. So let's look into what moral relativism is, and what I call the destroyer of all anarchy. Moral relativism, or the destroyer of anarchy, is the ideology or religion that objective morality does not even exist inherently to nature, and that right and wrong are subjective constructs which human beings may invent and arbitrarily decide upon according to time, location, circumstance. They, they're inventing them and they're arbitrating them according to time, location, circumstance, or preference. In truth and reality, morality is objective. Rights can never become wrongs, and wrongs can never become rights at any place or time, regardless of how many people believe or wish for it to be so. Right and wrong are objective and exist in nature, because the actions that comprise right behavior or wrong behavior are carried out in the 3D physical domain, in the realm of nature. So, of course... The characteristics of those behaviors exist in the 3D domain, exist in the world of nature. They are not constructs that exist in the mind. 
Moral relativism is a construct that exists only in the mind. The belief that human beings are the arbiters of right and wrong. Well, if human beings are the arbiters of right and wrong, they can nullify rights anytime they want to also. It's a satanic mindset. That's one of the four overarching principles or tenets of Satanism. Moral relativism is tenet number two, right behind egotism. Egotism, moral relativism, social Darwinism, and eugenics are the four pillars or four tenets, major tenets of Satanism. Well, this is one of them, and it is what I can call the destroyer of anarchy. You cannot be a moral relativist and be an anarchist. All moral relativists are destroying the potential for anarchy to manifest in the world. Any society of human beings that believes that there is no natural, objective difference between right behavior and wrong behavior, and believe that human beings may arbitrarily, arbitrarily create or decide what right and wrong are for themselves, is a society that can never create true freedom by bringing their behavior into alignment with natural law, because they don't even believe natural law exists. They believe we get to arbitrarily decide and dictate what morality is. Since the governing dynamics of human freedom are predicated upon the aggregate morality of a society, it is a total and permanent impossibility for true freedom or anarchy to ever exist in a society that embraces moral relativism. Freedom can not ever exist in a society that embraces moral relativism. The last time I did social experiments to determine how many people in our society were moral relativists, we got the result the same as we always have, two-thirds. Two out of three people in the world are moral relativists. And that is why the world will never become free until that dynamic changes. Until close to 100% of human beings are moral objectivists, Never expect freedom, expect enslavement. And that is the only dynamic that you not only will get, it is the only dynamic that you can get according to the laws of creation. You must live in enslavement if two-thirds of the society believes in moral relativism. The next religions. There's more. Yes, there are more religions of fake-ass anarchists. And until they abandon every one of these religions, don't expect the dynamic to change. They're not real anarchists. They're not helping create true freedom. They're not helping end slavery on earth. They're people spinning their wheels in circles endlessly going nowhere. And Mark, speaking of going nowhere, Marxism and socialism won't get you nowhere, but they'll definitely get you six feet under real quick. Responsible for... Over 200 million deaths in the 20th century alone. Marxism and socialism. If there ever was an antichrist, Karl Marx is it. If there ever was a person who was so wrong in his thinking, regardless of whether he believed it or just wrote it and didn't even believe it, or you know whether it was given to him, this is who the Communist Manifesto, he and Engels, it is ascribed to. It is said that they wrote it. I personally believe they were more pen people, get just put put out in the public eye, but they were occult uh, initiates. Here you see him giving the hidden hand symbol with his hand inside of his jacket, saying, I'm initiated into uh, secret societies of higher knowledge than the public has. But if there ever was a true figure of destroying the ability to ascend in consciousness by giving people an idea that would help them to destroy themselves. Century after century, it is Karl Marx. Karl Marx is one of the biggest antichrist figures in all of human history, as far as I'm concerned. And the, the, the whole idea of following his identification as a worker, I mean, you have to have a pretty low opinion of yourself. If that's what you think you are as an expression of all consciousness, you believe that you, you identify as a worker and think that this guy was, was cared about you and was helping you trying to create a, quote, worker's paradise that would be controlled, the production would be controlled by the state, and then they would get so powerful and they would just distribute it so perfectly and evenly and, uh, you know, uh, in a, uh, uh, an equitous manner to everyone that suddenly the state would just say, what's the need for us and we'll dissolve ourselves. That's what this imbecile actually got people to believe this imbecile wrote that and got other low-level fledgling imbeciles to believe that imbecilism he actually got people to buy that p 
pure fucking nonsense. Okay? And that's why there's so many socialists in the world today, is because this clown's uh, economic theories are taught and classist theories are taught. According to Merriam-Webster, socialism is government ownership and administration of the means of production and distribution of goods, really goods and services, a system of society or group living in which there is not private property, a system or condition of society in which the means of production are owned and controlled by the state, not by the collective, but by the state. Now they're trying to convince people it means collective ownership which there is no such thing. Nobody can really collectively decide on how something is used unless they are in perfect agreement. Which never really occurs, even in a small grouping of people, let alone a society of billions. So these are more religious ideologies of the fake anarchists. And most of the ones on the left-wing factions believe in Marxism and socialism, and he's one of their gods, their heroes, and socialism is something that they aspire to instead of realizing that it leads to mass deaths and gulags and totalitarian government. Because no government that has the means of production of everything that anybody in that society needs to survive is ever going to dissolve itself. Got news for you. Idiots out there that believe in socialism. That never happens in the real world. That only happens in the books, the dumbass books that you read and believe are true. You haven't read the right books yet, fools. And here's the other thing that people are ultra foolish about. And I'll show you the look that they give when you bring it up. Even though they're no nothing clowns and the people who really understand the occult understand high level dynamics about how the world really works in nature. Okay? What they really have the ignorance of, I, I'm writing the word ignorance like this from now on. They're in ignorance of the occult. They ignore it. As if it doesn't exist, it'll magically go away. There's no covert religion going on in the world. No. This is all just some crazy, uh, you know, quirky little religious belief uh, that came out of, uh, you know, pagan mythology or something like that. And there's no occult societies, there's no secret societies that have occult knowledge, you know, there's no knowledge in the world that's being hidden from them. They know everything. That's the thing, is that they know everything. They they haven't looked into this, yet they'll dismiss it, and that's the height of stupidity and ignorance, is to say, I know this, and I know it's not real, but oh, have I looked into it? No, not a bit, not at all. Yeah, but they're still going to talk out their ass. And here's what they look like. People who are in complete ignorance of the occult. They ignore it completely as if it will magically go away by ignoring it. Yeah, you, you bring up the occult to them and this is the jackass that they look like. You know, this meme. Okay? Uh, rolling their eyes. Oh, the, uh, this. Uh, I'm going to hear about this. And, you know, uh, secret societies and uh, the Illuminati. Yeah. Uh, and they roll their eyes thinking that they know. Yet they haven't studied one occult book. They haven't cracked open one occult tome. They haven't looked into one occult ideology or, or philosophy. They haven't read, uh, you know, anything into high-level occultism, dealing with hermetics, dealing with Freemasonry or Rosicrucianism. They know nothing of it. You know, have they read the Harmonic series, something like that? Have they read the workings of Manly P. Hall? Have they taken or watched my natural law seminar? No, 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 and no. No, but they think they're qualified to speak on it. <clears throat> and they don't even know what occultism is. They think it's some religious form of thought, and it is not. Occultism is science. It is hidden science. It is science that is hidden from the masses the, so, so that they could be more easily controlled. The word occult is derived from the Latin adjective occultus, meaning hidden. Occultism is the study of the hidden laws of nature, natural law, specifically those laws which are at work in the invisible mental and spiritual domain far more than those at work in the invisible or physical world. Therefore, occultism involves the acceptance of a much wider worldview than that which is ordinarily taken by the everyday person. Occultists then may de be defined as those who study all the laws of nature, both those that are readily seen like the physical laws and those which are much more difficult to see with the physical eyes or measuring instruments alone like natural law. 
the laws of morality and behavioral consequence. What is occultism's hidden knowledge? Occultism is a body of science not widely known to the general population consisting of hidden knowledge about the workings of the human psyche depicted here on the left as the minor arcana, the fool card and the tarot deck. That's the human psyche and the soul, the individual, self-knowledge. And the laws of nature depicted on the right hand side by the major arcana, the world card on the tarot deck representing the universe, the seemingly outer world, the physical sciences, etc., and how natural law works. Those are the unseen, the, the, the physical laws of the, the material world, the, the physical world, and the unseen laws, the spiritual laws, including natural law. So those are the two bodies, major bodies of occult knowledge, minor arcana, microcosm, inner world, knowledge of the self, knowledge of the human psyche and how it operates, major arcana, macrocosmic world, the so-called seemingly outer world. It's still consciousness, but it's not contained within our brain mind. It's, you know, in our physical domain. The knowledge of natural law, the universal moral laws of creation uh, that govern behavioral consequence and the knowledge of the physical sciences that the governing dynamics of the physical world. And if you look at those two bodies of knowledge, that's everything. That's everything that is important to understand and learn. So why do people have such resistance to knowledge about knowledge about the occult? Why are they so resistant to taking in knowledge about the occult world? Well, it's because in the so-called anarchist community, there's a prevalence of atheism and scientific materialism. Scientism, atheism, materialism, secularism prevalence of that. More people in the anarchist community are secular, so-called anarchists, than are not. And once again, I, I've said there is no such thing as a truly secular anarchist. There is no such thing as a non-spiritual anarchist. There is no such thing as an atheistic anarchist. No such thing as an atheist anarchist. And that's why they're so resistant to the world of the occult. They don't understand. If you want anarchy to exist in the world, in the external domain, in the domain in which we live and operate, you have to understand the workings of the occult. The end. It's, it's eternally true. Most people are going to reject it because they don't want to bring that into their uh, research discussion. They don't want to turn people off and lose their audience. But the bottom line is, there is no accurate understanding of the world of anarchy without an accurate understanding of the world of the occult. They go hand in hand and can never be separated. Get as offended as you like, it's still true. Left brain dominance and lack of spiritual development resulting from the modern outcome-based education system, which is putting people into secularism, postmodernism, solipsism, etc., Belief that secular goals of power and money are the ultimate desires of the ruling class. Wrong and incorrect. You get the answer wrong. Go back and try again. M money and power are not the ultimate goals. They're means to an end. The ultimate goals is they want to control and destroy the human soul. That is what the ruling class really wants. They are Satanists. They are dark Luciferians. They are dark occultists who want to enslave and destroy the human soul soul. That is what this is all about, folks. It is not just about power and money. If you think that, you're a naive little boy and a naive little girl. That's not the ultimate goal. Those are means to an end. And finally, in their mentality, they refuse to accept the existence of a covert religion at work in our world. They don't want to accept that covert religion is all around us. And the people don't speak about it. They hide it from others. Yet they are member. They are in membership and in league with these dark occult secret societies and religions. Absolutely. You know, but the the fake ass anarchist doesn't want to hear about that because then that opens up the whole can of worms of actual occult covert religion in the world operating in secret. The fake-ass anarchists all have a complete dearth of knowledge and an ignorance of natural law. And once again, if you ignore natural law, you cannot create real anarchy. So I call this section ignorance of natural law or 
the lack of understanding of the true laws of manifestation. People do not understand and do not want to understand how freedom manifests. And we're going to go over it again. Natural law is a science of freedom. It's based on a law that can be quantified. It can be written down in an equation form. And you can fill in the numbers. You could figure out the numbers and fill them in. And you'll get the answer. Correct. Just like any other equation in science. If you want to make it that left brain and dry, can you do that? Yeah, you can. Okay? Natural law is a science of morality that can be directly observed in operation in the 3D world. The evidence of the existence of natural law is the resultant state of existence which humanity receives as a direct consequential result of its aggregate behavior. Or in other words, they receive the human condition itself. That is the conditions that they receive. And that's why we're in a human condition of slavery. We have received the condition of slavery because morality was not great enough, was not in enough abundance in the equation. The law of freedom has a quantifiable effect in the world. Aggregate freedom is directly proportional to aggregate morality. We collectively reap the result of the behavior that we collectively sow. The law of freedom can be written as an equation. The sum of of freedom is proportional to the sum of morality. The sum of freedom in any given society is directly proportional to the sum of freedom in any given society. That is the law of freedom written out in scientific terms. It is not a belief system. It is not a religion. It is not a guess. It is a science and it is describes exactly how behavior and consequence works in the 3D physical domain in the manifested universe, anywhere in the 3D universe. Fake-ass anarchists, unfortunately, have no understanding of the true laws of manifestation, and as a result, they are the retarded child who keeps putting his hand on the lit burner on the stove and expecting not to get burnt. They're retarded. That's what a retarded child does. The people in the fake-ass anarchist community are retarded children. Listen to me once again say it in no, in totally unequivocal terms. The people in the fake anarchist community are retarded children that are repeatedly putting their hand on the burner over and over and over and over again and the flesh melts off of it down to the bone every time and every time they come back and put their hand on it again expecting a different fucking result. The vast majority of modern so-called anarchists still do not recognize or understand the underlying causal factors for the human condition of slavery. Most modern anarchists pay lip service to freedom without ever becoming aware of the true natural governing dynamics which actually determine the level of freedom which human society will or can experience. They see the problems that we face only from the level of the symptoms, the realm of that which has already manifested, the, the realm of effects as I'm going to talk about but they lack the required knowledge to accurately identify the true causes of those problems, which invariably lie in the aggregate consciousness of the human population, and I would say in the aggregate moral spirituality of the human population, the moral choices that the human population has made by growing into a spiritually mature adult. Our reality is built upon the trivium truth discovery process to get us to an understanding of natural law. Without the truth discovery process of the trivium, as a society, we cannot develop an understanding of natural law and therefore bring our behavior into alignment with it. The trivium is an ancient methodology of truth discovery, which enables an individual to learn how to think. The word trivium comes from the Latin tria, meaning three, and the Latin noun via meaning path the uh, forms of the trivium in the ancient world it was knowledge grammar and or input and then uh, i'm sorry it was knowledge understanding and wisdom in the classical trivium it's grammar logic and rhetoric these are the three stages that can never be taken out of order it's in that order and then input processing and output so the knowledge stage is, or grammar or input is getting all the information together so that you could start going through it and understanding it. The second stage is 
processing that information. That's the logical step, the, applying logics, applying, um, you know, uh, weeding out inconsistencies, applying logical fallacies to arguments, and coming to a correct understanding of what the knowledge that you gathered in step one means. Then once you have processed it and you've come to an accurate understanding of it, then it's what you do with it. Okay, what are you going to then do with that understanding that you have amassed? You output it. You put it out to other people. That's your rhetoric stage. You speak it to others. You teach it to others so that they can come to understand it. And that's doing the right thing with what you have come to know and understand, which is what true wisdom is. Those are the steps of the trivium. The tools of the trivium and quadrivium, which is an adjunct to the trivium, uh, quantification adjunct, uh, of the physical sciences, the tools of the trivium help individuals to remove their erroneous belief systems and their magical thinking. Because many people in this movement and in the world, that's all they're engaged in is magical thinking. And the tools of the trivium help us to come to an accurate, to accurate conclusions about what is true and what is not true, including the truth about the natural laws that govern human behavior. The trivium method is, not at all surprisingly, completely absent from almost all modern so-called education systems because the rulers of the world, the ruling class, occultists, do not want children, except their own children, coming into an understanding of truth of how this world operates with the trivium method. They want that removed. And here's how it works. Knowledge or lack thereof, so knowledge or ignorance, uh, this first building block of the trivium represents available information, constitutes all potential forms of data that may be gathered, processed, understood, and acted upon by any individuals in any given society. Step number two is the understanding step. This is how we formulate our decision-making processes that are going to be the basis of how we act. Processing of available information, which takes place within the human mind, and becomes the life choices of each individual. That's what this step is. Our decision-making processes comes from the processing of available information that takes place in our mind, and then that becomes what is going to be our life choices through our behavior. That's the second step, or the processing step of the trivium. Then we have the output step, wisdom, or lack thereof. So we have... Knowledge or ignorance, understanding or confusion, wisdom or folly. And this is our behavioral step. This is the step that comes from, you know, that, that uh, is uh, described as how do we behave in the world. Each individual's behavior is based upon the quality of their decision-making process in step two, which in, turn, in turn was based upon the quality of their available information in step one. So these are all built on top of each other, can never be taken out of context and can never be, the steps can never be, uh, you know, taken out of the proper order of one, two, three, knowledge, understanding, wisdom, available information gathered first, your processing of that information of that knowledge second to come to an understanding that is going to inform your decision making processes. And then finally, what are we going to do based upon what, what knowledge we have gathered and how we understand that knowledge? We're going to behave in a certain way. Either our behavior is going to be good, output good quality behavior on the screen of life, or we're going to output junk onto the screen of life. Okay? And that then becomes the result. The trivium creates the result. The three blocks, the colored blocks on the bottom, create the white block on the top, which is our manifested reality that we all then must live in. The quality of that condition, the quality of the condition which manifests in any society, called the human condition, is based upon the aggregate quality of behavior in that society, whether it is moral, meaning it is good output on the, on the screen or the printer of life, or it is bad behavior or immoral behavior, and then we get slavery. We get chaos. Okay, So we either get freedom based on moral behavior in the aggregate, or we get slavery and chaos based on the um, immoral output of that collective aggregate behavior. That is how the trivium works to create our reality. And our understanding of it goes hand in hand with that to create the reality that we experience. Another thing about the laws of manifestation that fake ass anarchists refuse to accept and recognize is causality. They're still in this notion that things are a random series of chaotic events and they are not. 
There are causes for everything that takes place. So I've described this in other presentations where I break down these occult principles as, uh, as they have been called in different schools of occultism, the plane of effects versus the plane of causality. The plane of effects are manifested realities which have formed because of their underlying causes. No power to affect change lies in the world of effects, in the plane of effects. But unfortunately, this is where human consciousness seems to be trapped. All the fake anarchists, they're all talking about the plane of effects, modern institutions, uh, you know, financial schemes and scams, politicians, uh, the, the whole, you know, uh, coronavirus pandemic as just from a physical perspective and analyzing the vi so-called virus and the masks and the mask orders and all of this, right? They're never getting to the underlying causal factors of why. Why lies in philosophy? Why lies in spirituality? The top level, the plane of effects, that's the physical reality. It's already happened. You can't reverse time. You know, but you can start now going into the plane of causality and understand why those things happened. So the top level, the plane of effects, that's physical reality, worldly happenings, the results that we receive, the results that we get as a result of our aggregate behaviors according to natural law principles. Were they in alignment with them? Were they not in alignment with them? We get a different effect based on the quality of our aggregate behavior. The plane of causality, on the other hand, is where our consciousness must go. All the power to affect change lies in that plane of, of mentation, of mentality and spirituality and the understanding of why. The, it is the why that underlies and precedes manifested reality. It's the mental or spiritual reality. It's the why it happened. It causes the results. These causes cause the results that happen in the plane of effects up top. This is the direction of manifestation. Watch the uh, human head and the earth now, okay? I'm going to uh, apply a, a, a graphic effect that shows the direction that the, our reality manifests. This is how it always manifests. It always manifests from the plane of causality to the plane of effects. This is where consciousness has to go to that level, deeper, underneath the physical level, and go to the plane of causality, what is operating in the human mind. The first Hermetic principle is that the all is mental. The universe is, a, is ultimately a construct of mentation, of mental power that then becomes the physical things. Our thoughts become what we experience. And if we have absolute crap going on in our brain, believing in things that aren't true and then behaving immorally as a result, the world's our experience of the world is going to be crap. It's very simple and flows very logically, actually. But that's the di direction that reality manifests from the plane of causality to the plane of effects. Fake ass anarchists are not looking at the level of causality. Very, very, very few of them are. They're go trying to go the not even the opposite direction. They're trapped in the plane of effects, analyzing just the 3D institutions and worldly events. And that's never going to get you to the understanding of why what's happening is happening or how to get out. Never happen. Only by going to the plane of causality and understanding the causal factors will you ever understand why and get out of the current human condition and build a better human condition. This is something that I uh, added specifically for this presentation is a decoding of the side view of the Great Pyramid as an allegory. In the occult, this is widely known that the pyramid was built not only for whatever other physical purposes it was built for, the Great Pyramid at Giza, Khufu's Pyramid as they call it, um, it was built as an allegory for life's journey. So the Great Pyramid at Giza is decoded in occult philosophy to represent life's journey in consciousness and spirituality. So let's look at this brilliant allegory because this also explains how uh, the whole dynamic of natural law really works. But moreover, one thing I want to focus on this image is that Queen's Chamber, right? We're going to talk about the King's Chamber as I break this down briefly, but um, the Queen's Chamber is applying to all the fake forms of anarchy. While they could understand that anarchy is the absence of rulership and that it does represent uh, freedom, right? They're still not getting to that King's Chamber level that takes you to the higher levels of awareness and reality. Okay, so let's look at this allegory briefly. This entrance to the pyramid on one side is birth. Okay, that's coming into the physical world and um, 
uh, incarnating into the world of matter. And then you could see immediately it's a downward trajectory. That isn't to say that the physical world is bad. It's to say that basically from the start we're being taught materialism and lack of spirituality. That that's the default condition. That's the entropic condition. This is sort of entropy. We're starting on a downward scale unless we actually apply our will to learn and grow. Okay? Which would put us on an upward trajectory. Because really where we want to go is to the stars. The star shafts, as they are called, lead from the queen's chamber and king's chamber. And then if we stay on that material path of uh, lack of spirituality, um, we are going to enter the realm of Satanism and slavery. And this is almost where we are at. We are down by the bottom of that pathway, getting ready to go into that chamber that represents total enslavement brought on through satanic ideology. And fake anarchist ideology is often hand-in-hand with satanism and satanic ideology. Hand-in-hand with it. If we go into that path, there's a better than average chance, or really an almost a certainty, that we will then go extinct as a species at some point in the future. We will not evolve to any different form. That will be the end of our evolutionary journey because we chose wrongly. We chose the wrong path. We chose the incorrect path and the immoral path, which are one and the same. So we didn't learn enough to choose the correct and moral path. And that is involution. That's the the expression of involution, which is extinction. The force that destroys evolutionary progress and stunts and says, no, no further. You had your chance. Now new forms will have their chance. If we choose to go away from that descending passageway, we come to a place that I call limited spirituality. This is where you're at least trying to begin the learning process of understanding truth, natural law, spirituality, and develop an understanding of the self and those laws of creation. But it's still limited. One might only be like taught it like from a religious family or uh, a school teacher or a friend. And it's a very religious approach. It's not really initiated into knowledge of morality and how the laws of morality work. It's again, being nice to other people or doing good things for other people just because Jesus in the New Testament said so and the priest told you that if you didn't, you're going to go to hell. It's a, it's a child's view of morality at this point. It's a very childish, limited viewpoint of it that can only really lead to religious thought. And that's what the Queen's Chamber represents in the allegorical side view of the Great Pyramid's internal structures. The Queen's view was traditional religion. And it, it's really not just traditional religion, it's the heart of traditional religion. It's the moral teachings that was at the heart of the tr- traditional religions, which then they all went astray from because they became corrupted worldly institutions focused on dogma and control of other people instead of teaching them the moral principles that really lay at their heart. Okay, so you can get to the queen's chamber and then as a result, you get to the star shafts, the two star shafts. I'm pointing at just the one on the left here, uh, which represents freedom, evolution, the way out of slavery and uh, the way out of uh, the, the degradation of humanity and involution. But this is only unconscious morality. It's the kind of morality that someone who's a religious nutter can still achieve, right? But really, they have no understanding of how the real laws of creation work. They can accidentally fall into this religion Uh, point of view and mindset and then their behaviors will align with natural law but they won't have them consciously aligned with natural law they will only be unconsciously aligned to them so this is not a sustainable path because any variable can come in and upset that delicate structure that delicate house of cards and destroy that society's morality because they don't really have it deep what if a wacko uh, psycho um, a religionist becomes their high priest in their in their religion or cult, and then he starts leading them in an immoral path, and then saying, "Oh, the scriptures of here, we found other decodings of them, and here's what they were saying," and he just makes up whatever he feels like. You know, you could see that religion that way doesn't really constitute a science of understanding how morality works. So it is not long-term sustainable in a civilization. 
It can get you there sort of almost accidentally and get you to a state that resembles real freedom, but it is not sustainable. It is not going to stay that way for long because there's no deep understanding of natural law. So that's the middle path there, the queen's chamber path. Here, if we continue the upward journey and we don't set up camp halfway up the mountain, okay, if we don't stop in our understanding, we then get initiated into occult knowledge. The Grand Gallery represents the stairway to the King's Chamber, which represents higher level knowledge of occultism and how things really work that have been un unfortunately hidden from most people in our society because the occultists want to rule over people. The Grand Gallery represented initiation into that occult knowledge instead of a religious mindset and a religious approach to mo morality. And that could lead to the king's chamber, which in this allegory represents a very deep, profound understanding of natural law. And then aligning our behavior to it gives us this, the, the true higher star shafts leading from the king's chamber, the two places uh, on left and right, representing true freedom, true evolution, the way out of slavery, and conscious morality which is long-term sustainable in a civilization because it is the conscious awareness of how the science of natural law actually functions in our world. That is conscious morality and it is long-term sustainable. So, I hope people uh, watching the presentation uh, enjoyed this uh, little um, journey into this occult allegory of the pyramid. What I'm basically trying to really liken it to here is that traditional religious beliefs of that queen's chamber sort of amounts to what some of the uh, ideologies of uh, anarchism, like for example, agorism or voluntarism, can somewhat get you to from what I would consider a more religious perspective. They think I have the religious perspective because I'm talking about cosmic moral law. It's the exact way around. They have the religious perspective because they believe that only the physical, financial, and social aspects can get you there. What I'm talking about is we need the science, the knowledge of the science of morality under our belt. Then we can really get to that king's chamber level, which represents conscious morality and therefore sustainable freedom. There is this last thing, this escape shaft, and this is where I think we're really going to go, where we're really going to have to take. We're going to have to take this approach. We're not going to take the approach where we just take the ascending passageway to the Grand Gallery, to the King's Chamber, and then we're, we're born again through into the stars. Not going to happen with, with this bunch. This bunch called humanity is too fucking stubborn for that. Okay, so we are almost in that pit called, you know, uh, what that I'm likening to total slavery of the human species, and then the species going extinct after that, which would be a mercy killing if it if it, on the timeline it's only that much time. That would represent, thank God, it only lasts that long, and then we go extinct. Okay, but I'd say we're right before entering that Satanism and slavery chamber, almost at the mouth of it, at the at the mawing mouth of it. Okay, the, the gaping maw of, of that chamber. We are there. And we're going to have to turn around and take the escape shaft to make our way to the Grand Gallery, the initiation into the occult. You know, but that is a torturous climb. It's the narrowest and to most torturous vertical ascent in the whole allegory. And it is it represents awakening via hardcore suffering. There is no easy out from this point because we've worked our way into the pit. OK, we've chosen the left hand path. We've chosen the way of maximum pain. And that escape shaft represents awakening by the skin of our teeth through enormous suffering. And that's where humanity is at right now. And guess what? That's about the best option that I could think is going to manifest. Because we're headed really absolutely at a million miles an hour into Satanism, slavery, and extinction. That's where we're really going. If we don't turn it around real soon. My final section is called Why So Many Fakes? One Big Psyop. It's actually... Uh, second to last because I'm going to talk about what's really required to get out of the religion and mentality that the fake ass anarchists have moved themselves into. So why are there so many fake anarchist factions? I call this the one big psyop. What is a psyop? It's psychological warfare, also called psyops. 
a military term used to describe any action which is practiced mainly by psychological methods, which has the goal of evoking a planned psychological reaction in those against whom it is employed. The many forms of fake-ass anarchism comprise a huge psyop that is being perpetrated against the people of our world. It is also perpetrated against the fake-ass anarchists themselves, as many of them are not knowingly malicious, but misled due to their colossal, willful ignorance of truth and reality. And because they don't have the method of the trivium in hand, and they have limited or no spirituality. And they think they're right, and they think they have all the information when they do not. The fake anarchism psyop has a two-pronged effect upon all of humanity. Number one, the ruling class who is running the PSYOP, the occult ruling class running this PSYOP, keeps their potential opponents completely ineffective and spinning in circles, believing and thinking that they are doing, thinking and doing things that, that, I'm sorry, thinking and doing things that will never and can never lead to true freedom, but believing that they are doing things that can lead to true freedom. That is what the fake-ass anarchist movement believes. They think they're going to do things leading to true freedom when the PSYOP has them in a state of mind, in a mental state, that can never lead to true freedom. They're, they're victims of the PSYOP that they've bought into themselves. And then the second pronged um, effect, number two, is... The ignorant public is led to believe through mainstream media propaganda and repetition that the fake-ass anarchists and their so-called movements, they ain't moving anywhere, in any way represent real anarchy. This makes the public antagonistic to, toward true anarchists, and most importantly, it makes the public believe that anarchy itself, or true freedom, is dangerous to human society. That is what the PSYOP is designed to do. It is to keep the people who might get to true anarchy confused, doing all the wrong things, believing in all the wrong things, and doing things that will never lead to true freedom because they don't understand natural law and have not aligned their behavior to it. Secondarily, but even po possibly more important to that, they're making the public believe anarchy is something that it is not and never was. And that not only that it is something that it never was, but it's actually dangerous and that they should fear it. Because these ass clowns throw trash cans through a Starbucks window. You know, these, these agent provocateur anarchists, so-called, or leftist anarchists, or, or whoever it is. doesn't matter what faction or category we're talking about. They can look at all the t pure idiot mentality and, and imbecilism of all of these fake ass anarchists and then just put that on television almost like a comedy show for themselves but then it's a horror show for the public that believes that's anarchy and that those are anarchists that's why they're doing the psyop and most people are eating it up with with a big ass spoon you know we have to take it back folks we can't let it people believe that Anarchists just dress in all black, cover their face, spray paint things, destroy property. Th these aren't anarchists. You know, half of these people are communists in disguise. Not only do we need to take back the word, we need to take back the symbol, like I said. Here's the thing. Anybody that uses a word and they're not really that thing and, and claim to be, they're fakes anyway. So the word doesn't, quote, belong to them. And they're not, ma they're making the word, they're trying to make the word, deliberately trying to make the word mean something that it doesn't mean. And I say, take the word back. Explain to people what anarchy really is, what it's really contingent upon. Natural law, objective morality, aligning our behavior to objective morality under natural law. Let's take the symbol back. People go, oh, nobody should use the spray paint type anarchy symbol. I'll use whatever fuck symbol I want. You're not going to tell me what symbol I'll use. I'll use whatever I want. Want to know why? I know what it really means. The symbol represents the word. Know what the word means first if you're going to use the symbol. Let's take the symbol back. It doesn't belong to leftists. It doesn't belong to totalitarians. It doesn't belong to fascists. It doesn't belong to socialists. It doesn't belong to communists. It represents anarchy, and the word has an accurate definition. So if the symbol is supposed to represent the word, let's take that back and let it mean the accurate definition and explain that to people as well. Nobody's going to tell me I'm not going to use a symbol. I know what the symbol means. I know what the word means, and I'm right. I'm correct. Assholes like this are not correct. 
They just think that they're correct, but they haven't studied enough. They haven't acquired enough information. They haven't processed it, processed it and come to an accurate understanding of it, and they certainly aren't doing the right things. So I'm not going to let them or anybody else tell me I can't use a word or a symbol when I know what the real meanings are, and I'm not a fake variant of it. I'm the genuine article. I'm the real fucking thing. Finally, to wrap up, what the fake-ass anarchist community has to do is develop the ability to say I was wrong because that is the beginning of all spirituality. The beginning of all of, of spiritual journeys begins with saying I was wrong and I don't know and I need more information to develop my mind and to develop my soul. I need more knowledge. They are in a dearth of knowledge. They are bereft of knowledge in many cases. They are in what I call negative knowledge. Not only don't they have any knowledge, they're not even at the zero point. They're in the negative realm because they believe things that aren't true and have no truth, no true knowledge among them. They have to make first, before they even develop any of that knowledge, what is known as the cosmic apology. The most powerful phrase in all of human language is simultaneous, the most difficult phrase for any human being to speak it. It is this, I was wrong. And I've had to say that tens of thousands of times throughout my journey in life to admit that I did not have the information correct. I did not have the understanding of how the world really works correct. And then I had to do hardcore soul searching and sit in front of that mirror and understand I was part of the problem because of my ignorance. And then I started really learning the truth. And that was a powerful, long, arduous journey that takes hard work and commitment. And that's what the, all the fake-ass anarchists in the world have to do. They need to make that apology. Because only when those who have been inauthentic, when those who have been incorrect and even immoral because of their incorrect thinking, when finally those people say that, that phrase, I was wrong, first to themselves, first and foremost to the self, the first step of initiation is do not lie to yourself and then don't lie to any others. And then they say I was wrong to all of creation, not just to just people around them, to the universe itself to consciousness itself, to creation itself. Only when they make that cosmic apology will they finally then be able to begin their great journey toward true healing and true spiritual awakening. Ladies and gentlemen, that in and of itself is the very beginning of the one great work. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and attention here today.